Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, the producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Dr. Josh Sharfstein speaks to Dr. Shawnee Bugs, assistant professor in the Violence Prevention Research Program at the University of California, Davis. They discuss programs to reduce violence that are based in communities, how they work, why they work, and their future. Let's listen. Dr. Bugs, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about community-based approaches for addressing gun violence. And I'm going to start with a pretty basic question. What are we talking about when we say a community-based approach to address gun violence? Sure. And thank you, Josh, for having me on. When many people think about the problem of gun violence, they think often about the gun itself. And they think about gun legislation. And we know that that is a politically difficult issue for legislators to address. Community-based solutions understand that while those legislative decisions are really important and access to firearms is really crucial for addressing gun violence, community-based solutions really are about working with community members to determine how gun violence is reduced in their communities. And it involves engaging and employing members from the community to be part of the solution. Got it. So instead of thinking about you know, things like background checks, we're talking about what's leading to violence in the first place in a community. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's recognizing that violence is a symptom rather than the underlying cause of the issues in communities as it relates to gun violence. And so it's about thinking about the root causes of violence and how to address those in ways that engage the community in the solution and have the community members as the professionals who are doing the intervention and prevention work themselves. Wow. So could you give me an example of a place that is implementing a community-based approach like this? Sure. Well, right here in Baltimore, there's a program called Safe Streets that is based on a model that was developed by an epidemiologist who saw similarities between infectious disease and violence. He saw that violence spreads in a way similar to contagious diseases. And so the model utilizes violence interrupters, individuals who work in the community. They have relationships with individuals who are at highest risk for violence involvement, and they work to mediate conflicts between individuals or groups that could escalate to lethal violence, as well as to connect those individuals to services and supports. When we're talking about individuals who are at high risk for violence involvement, there are often a host of needs that those individuals have in order to change the trajectory of their lives and steer them towards nonviolent outcomes. Got it. So when you said this is based on the idea that violence moves like an infectious disease, the whole idea that people get hurt and then they retaliate and there's another retaliation and there's another retaliation has sort of a similarity to a virus getting passed around. Yes, it does. And similarly, if you can identify the individuals who are at high risk for violence in the same way that you can identify individuals who may be spreading an infection, then you can quell the violence. One thing you haven't mentioned in describing models like this is the police. You know, you're talking about community members themselves working to mediate disputes, actually trying to interrupt the transmission of violence from person to person. But you haven't mention the police. Yes. So when I'm talking about community members, I am talking about individuals who live in those communities that have the high rates of violence. Law enforcement often has contentious relationships with members of these communities where there are high rates of of violence. And so there is a lot of distrust and mistrust between law enforcement and community members. These strategies generally recognize that 
law enforcement is a reaction to violence and law enforcement will respond when there are violent incidents, but they don't have the relationships in order to be able to intervene before violence occurs. And they don't have the same established connections in the community to be able to link individuals to the services and supports that they may need. Got it. So in a way, if these approaches are successful, you get less violence. It's a prevention strategy and um, you don't have the need perhaps for, you know, as much of a law enforcement presence in a community. Exactly. It reduces law enforcement contact with members in the community and it helps individuals connect to the services and supports that we know that help to make communities safer. Things like economic assistance, housing, education, extracurricular activities, those those types of services and supports that that help to make communities safe. If there are more contacts with those kinds of supports, then there's less need for law enforcement presence. Got it. And I've, I've met some uh, police chiefs, for example, who are quite supportive of these kinds of strategies. Yes, they're not misaligned with law enforcement objectives. The whole objective is to keep communities safe. And many chiefs and members of the law enforcement community recognize that law enforcement is not the only answer that we should be using to respond to violence. The president of the United States just recently, and and the attorney general of the United States just recently talked about law enforcement not being the only strategy to addressing violence. And so members of the law enforcement community absolutely recognize that there are other strategies, these community-based strategies that can be effective and have been shown to be effective at reducing violence. Great. I'm going to ask you about that. How good is the evidence for these types of programs? Sure. So these programs have been around for decades in various capacities and using various models. The evidence is promising. Many of these strategies have been underfunded and they have not fully been rigorously evaluated. But the the ones that have have demonstrated really encouraging results. They have shown that you can reduce violence by utilizing non-law enforcement-based solutions. And how do they measure that? By shootings, for example, declining? Yes. Generally, they are looking at whether homicides or non-fatal firearm injuries increase or decrease or remain the same. But these strategies offer much more than that as well. And that is often not captured in traditional evaluations, but increasingly researchers are developing techniques to be able to measure how these different strategies, for instance, link individuals to supportive services and how they create stability in communities over time, how they may lead to individual personal transformation in ways that eventually translate into nonviolent norms in communities. So those are measured along with whether the gun violence outcomes go up or down. In other words, The evidence shows that these programs both reduce the things that we don't want, like homicides and shootings, and increase the things that we do want, like, you know, more people getting their life back on track. Absolutely. That is exactly what these programs are designed to do. They're designed to uplift individuals and families and communities and to provide access to health and well-being rather than just focusing on how to respond once harm has occurred. Got it. Now, what do you think the prospect is for a real investment in these kinds of programs? I imagine that over these decades, um, and I know from some experiences I've had, you know, they're funded, but often barely and not at the level that, you know, you think you might want them to be funded. And particularly, they're funded a very small fraction of more traditional approaches to containing violence. We wind up spending a lot after the fact, like you said, and not that much on the immediate prevention side. Do you think there are any prospects for that changing? I do. I think we're at a really exciting time as it relates to community-based violence prevention strategies. Last year, we saw, along with the pandemic, historic spikes in gun violence in many cities across the country. And we saw that many law enforcement officials recognized that these non-law enforcement-based strategies 
were necessary to help reduce violence. And they were hamstrung in ways by the pandemic that reduced their ability to engage with the community and to operate in ways that generally reduce violence. So there was real recognition last year by many law enforcement officials that we need more of these strategies. Also, excitingly, the Biden administration has recently announced an historic commitment of $5 billion over the next eight years to community-based violence prevention and intervention strategies. And it was historic because we've never seen our federal government invest in community violence prevention. So there's real excitement and encouragement coming from the federal government to invest in in people and invest in communities in, in ways that help to promote healing and help to promote well-being rather than just responding to the violence after it has occurred. So that $5 billion would really make a big difference in, for these types of programs. It absolutely would. And it's really encouraging to see that there's not only traction happening at the federal level around investing in community violence and intervention and prevention, but many mayors around the country are also recognizing that continued investment only in law enforcement and the criminal justice system without investing in violence prevention and intervention is doing more harm than good for communities. And so you're seeing at the local level, mayors standing up offices of violence prevention and making shifts in city dollars towards these kinds of solutions. Well, that is uh, something to really keep an eye on. The idea that we could have in many places across the country a complementary approach to violence that is really based in communities and is really focused on prevention. Yes. And there are various strategies. I talked earlier about one strategy that looks at violence as a similarly to a contagion, but there are various strategies that have roots in, in evidence and in science that shows that by providing intensive case management, by providing therapeutic services, by giving individuals access to services and supports that you can reduce violence. And so it is really encouraging that we have a host of strategies that we can begin using with increased investment. Dr. Bugs, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Listening.